by this point of you fans of Hotspot, I hope you know what comes up on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's candidate conversations where we introduce you to the men and women that are seeking your endorsement as members of the 37th Guam Legislature. Remember, the primary is just around the corner, just a couple weeks away. And I have two beautiful ladies, outstanding members of our community, leaders in their own right, very, very accomplished. Women that we are incredibly proud of. I am so honored to be joined by Dr. Sam Mabini Young. I forgot that your your real name is Shirley. <laughs> Thanks I've, for I've, 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 I've only ever called you Sam. So Thank you. Very good to see you. <laughs> May I just ask, how did you get the, the nickname Sam? My initials, I adopted those uh, at, during college. It's Shirley A. Mabini, S-A-M. Ah. Yeah, so my friends started calling me Sam when I was signing with my initials. You know what's crazy? I also never realized my initials too spell out my nickname. Which is? It's Jason. Jason oh, Arthur. Jace? Jason Arthur Salas. <laughs> I'm named after my grandfather and my middle name. So <laughs> we, we've learned a whole lot and we're only like 30 <laughs> seconds into the show, but very good to see you here, Doc. Thank you. All right. Uh, Equally impressive and equally lovely. I must say that is a beautiful, beautiful dress you have. Sarah Thomas Nedadog, it is always an honor to see you. Thank you, Jason. It's always nice to be here at KUAM. Yeah. I always feel at home here. Okay, is it still raining outside? I haven't, I haven't stepped no, outside. No, really. it's, it's good. Okay, well, yeah. born and raised in Dededo, I know that. Born I'm... and raised on Guam, born I'm... in Timuni, raised in Dededo. Oh, raised in Dededo. Okay, yeah. I, I'm from Ipapao State, so, you know. Yeah, like a... down the street. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every place on Guam is down the street. That's why I love this <laughs> island so much. Okay, so, uh, Sam, I'd like to start with you, and uh, for both you ladies, um, that's Mr. Peter's camera over there, and uh, you have 60 seconds just to tell, to tell the community about yourself, maybe even reintroduce yourself to your constituency, if you would, please. Good. Half a day, good morning. My name is Shirley, better known as Sam Mabini Young, and I was born and raised here in Guam, and uh, I went to school here at Academy, went to school at UOG, then transferred to San Fr University of San Francisco, um, later on got my master's and doctorate in Minnesota. I've had a uh, experience in both the private and public sector. Most people don't know about the private sector si side. Um, in Minnesota, excuse me, in Arizona, I was uh, an accountant. Um, I was also a banker in Minnesota. I worked for an engineering firm. And then I went back, when I came back to Guam, I was working at Guam Community College as an associate dean. Um, and I've also worked for other universities like University of Maryland Global College as an associate professor. And then other projects with Yoji. And most recently, I got a, a postdoc fellowship, which is basically a scholarship for somebody with a doctorate. Um, I live in Maina and have a beautiful, handsome husband, Melvin Young. Hey, Melvin, shout out to you. All, <laughs> all smiles right now. You want to say that like one more time, how, how handsome your husband is? He's gorgeous and handsome. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. I'm sure he's going to vote for you. I, I would hope that he would. But th thank you very much, Sam. It's always an honor to see you. All right, Sarah, you have 60 seconds. Uh, if you would, please. Yes. Uh, half a day, buenas. My name is Sarah Thomas Nedaduk. I was born and raised here on Guam from the village of Timining, later on in Dededo. And then my very handsome husband as well <laughs> is from the village of Hoggett. So we have, you know, north meets south, south meets north kind of thing and um, uh, so we have four children and um, I think a, two of them live here and then I have one that's in in the military in Japan the other ones in Portland but I have uh, been in the field of social services since 1977 so it's been several decades and I feel honored and blessed that I've worked with different populations young people, uh, families uh, with, young, with young children, veterans, and the elderly. And most recently, working with those who are um, homeless and who are struggling right now. So I'm very glad to be here, and I look forward to more questions. Thank you, you always light up any room you're in, Sarah. Oh, I've, wow. I've, I've, I've always enjoyed, if I've never told you, I've always enjoyed interviewing you so oh, much over the years and everything thank like that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Jason. You've always been a mentor to not only myself, but to so many here at KUM. So uh, congratulations to the both of you on your, on your senatorial you. runs. Yeah. Uh, and on that note, I would like to start with the Q&A, and we'll start with uh, Sam. You have 60 okay. seconds for each of these uh, responses. Um, and Sam, with this senatorial run, Again, maybe perhaps reintroducing yourself to older voters and maybe introducing yourself to first time voters, you know, mm -hmm. uh, younger people. Um, do you frame yourself in a different way than you did before? Are you, are you saying, okay, I'm a no frills, no BS fighter who's going to fix the problems that government's experiencing? Or do you say, I'm a savvy policymaker who knows the system and can effectively put forth solutions? Or am I 
an idea person, you know, like with, with fresh perspectives, or an amalgamation of the three? I believe it's a combination of all three. Mm -hmm. And since my last term as a senator in 2010 to, through 2012, um, I went back into the private sector. So I'm bringing back to the table a lot of work experience from the academic side, as well as the practical um, side. I, I was last the, uh, in the gov government of Guam, the labor director. And boy, did I learn a lot about, not just, not just about the operations, but about the critical nature of needing to understand um, our industries, the need of uh, what our students need in order to be part of that solution. So I'm, I'm also, I would like to say, very interested in having our government focus on research and information and data uh, so that we make data-driven decisions, mm -hmm. wiser decisions. Um, and, uh, I, and I certainly want smarter and sharper people to come to the table to help uh, you know, this, uh, find those solutions. All right, well, we are gonna drill into that, that data-driven mindset a little mm -hmm. bit later. I, that, I actually am very, very impressed with it. I, I must add, everybody, um, these two wonderful women here, if you look them up on LinkedIn or see their bios on KUM.com and you have like an iPad, it's like, swipe. Swipe, <laughs> swipe. Bo both of them incredibly well educated, incredibly um, you know accomplished, mm -hmm. and and you're like swipe, swipe, swipe. That's just the '80s. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, I'd like to go to you. Uh, you've obviously established yourself with a long list of accomplishments. You said many of them. Um, you've worked with our youth. You've worked with our homeless more recently. Um, nonprofit organizations. Why did you make the decision now to want to be a policymaker? For me, I felt like it was the next step for me. I had spent, you know, 40 some years working with our, with our grassroots, with our people on the ground, you know, listening to them, helping them make those connections in their relationships, helping them to move forward in their lives. And I thought, well, you know, what is it that I can do to take it to the next step, to, the, to move us forward? And I thought, you know, policy and I you know that's Guam legislature I feel I can make a contribution at the legislative uh, level mm -hmm. to bring my experiences and my understanding of the unique needs of our people you know from again the elderly to to our youth to our veterans and to persons who are homeless and bring that perspective to the legislature I think it's going to be an important one you know, for someone who has actually been out in the in the field with our with our people to bring the, their stories forward. Absolutely. So basically, going like even like as you said on a higher level, like literally the governing dynamics of, of how you yeah. can improve the quality of life here. Exactly. All right, very Thank very you. noble. All right, uh, Sam, I'd like to go to you. Um, a few years back, as you said, you know, you you left paradise behind to pursue, among other things, you know, like uh, data science studies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've done that too. It's a, it's a wonderful field, but. Um, I'm curious to know, does that approach, and now that you have, you know, like, let's say this quill in your, this arrow in your quill, right, to make data-driven decisions rather than, you know, gut instinct, intuition, or this is what we've always done in the past in Gulf Guam, do you bring that, that mindset, that attitude, you know, to the table as far as, you know, crafting policy? I believe I brought that even back in 2010. Mm, okay. Um, and the reason why I, I know that that's so critical, Jason, and if you've studied uh, what they call data analytics or big data um, and our, or machine learning. Mm -hmm. One of the key things that we have to, that we forget is that we, we as a government collect so much data, whether it's at rev tax, whether it's, um, whether it is uh, at, at, at one of the, uh, so our social service agencies and all of that data can be used to analyze, to start answering some of the critical questions and solving some of our, our problems instead of um, using anecdotal or using information that we read in the newspaper, talking to our neighbors, using real information, real data that can speak to uh, potential solutions. Um, I have observed through my research when I, I, I did receive that postdoc fellowship with ECMC, mm -hmm. we studied, I looked at what Alabama is doing and they're, they and many states are doing an incredible job in using data to inform policy, working with uh, their leaders. It's all picking up on, on uh, notable patterns and trying to use those, you know, to make better decisions. And Absolutely. I would dare say that, you know, the members of the Physicians Advisory Group, when we were right in the height of COVID, and Sarah, you mm -hmm. know this because you work with them every day, um, they were really putting forth that need to make data-driven decisions because they were like, okay, we're not going to do just what feels right or what, right. you know, the states are doing and everything like that. That's we right. need pertinent data that we have That's right. to make sure that we plot the right course. Mm -hmm. 
All right, very well said. All right, Sarah, um, your resume again uh, indicates that your life, your life pursuit, you touched on this a little bit, but you say specifically uh, you're in the human services profession. Can you break down for me and for all of our viewers, you know, how this passion and, and the formal background in that discipline uh, will translate to effectively authoring and then defending public policy? Absolutely. Um, as I shared with you before, I've worked with um, like organizations like Sanctuary, working with troubled youth and their families. I've worked with uh, the Adult Protective Services. We, in fact, we helped put that together many years ago in the, in the 80s. So we started adult protection, right? Because we saw the need uh, for persons who were being abused and neglected, and we needed to put together a system. And of course, since then, I've worked with several other governmental and nonprofit organizations. And I think that, you know, having done so um, helps me better understand the, the importance of good policy and the importance of uh, checks and balances as well, you know, and the role that legislators play um, in our government and in our community. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, um, I've, I've also been an educator, I've taught police at the police academy, I've taught at the University of Guam in social work. And so, you know, social services is, is, is essentially helping, helping our, our people and uh, understanding what their needs are and seeing how we can move them forward in their lives. And I believe you, you taught and you did some work in the social services sphere with uh, my late uncle, uh, Dr. Carl Diaz. Yes, yeah. absolutely. There, there is a scholarship at UOG under, under his name. Yes. Because he did yes, so much work. Exactly. There, yeah. 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 Very, yeah. very noble field. And I've, I've, yes. I've been told by so many people in social work locally, Guam can never have enough social, social right. workers. You know, we could put one on, on almost like every street corner and it wouldn't be enough. Yeah. All right. So yes. your leadership in that, in that, uh, in that avenue is going to be very, very much respected. All right. Yes. Okay, Sam, uh, let's go back to you. One of your past accomplishments, too, is you were formerly in charge of the Department of Labor. Yes. All right. So what thoughts have you on, since you did track unemployment workforce trends, uh, what ideas do you have about the current state of Guam's uh, job market with a possible recession, you know, just right on the horizon? You know, I looked at the labor market information, um, the current information, but I also tried to dig through some census data. Unfortunately, the 2020 hasn't uh, come out yet. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really struck me was that back in 2010, um, information regarding uh, our adults, there were about 56% of our adults that were, that were researched. And 10% um, had no high school diploma. Uh, about 20% had about some, excuse me, 37% had a high school diploma. About 20% had some college and the rest, about a quarter of our, of our population, adult population in 2010, had a college degree. And so I like to look at that kind of data to, because that's the kind of information that our businesses need to, to, to know. If we're wanting to attract, let's say, industries, we want to see whether do we need to do a better job in training our youth, our adults, in order to, to, you know, to bring our economy back, to bring our economy back with, with qualified uh, workers. So uh, you know, that's been always something very important to me, and I hope that the Department of Labor will continue using data to uh, help inform policy. Very well. Certainly, that, that agency produces a lot of data. All right, I want to go to uh, Sarah real quick, and then we'll go to our first commercial break. But uh, uh, Sarah, I'm sure your potential colleagues in the legislature are thinking, you know, when Sarah gets in, if she gets in, you know, what are going to be the bills that she puts forth, that she introduces, that she proffers, and like, how, how am I going to be able to involve with that? So let's say when you get elected, right, within the first 30 days, what will be the first pieces of legislation that you propose? Gosh, you just kind of alluded to that, and that is getting social workers out to the village level mm. and bringing drug and alcohol and behavioral health right there at the village level is to me is a is a must is a must do right away i think we learned a lot during the pandemic being isolated we saw the things that were happening in families you know there were good things because they spent more time together and they were bonding and there were some not so good things where people got together and it wasn't it wasn't always a good thing. We also saw how fragile we are as families and communities when we saw a mass exodus of people going out to the streets mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. So I think focusing on that in the first 30 days, I'm excited, I'm ready to go, because I think that's what we need to take a look at is how can we get these services 
in the villages and on the ground as soon as possible. Prevention, intervention, treatment programs, right straight to our people. Oh, very well. Well, I don't know if you heard that, but I, I think there was some uh, applause coming from uh, Manila. That was the UOG uh, social work department. They were saying, <laughs> yes, we're all behind that. So tell yes. you what, ladies, we're going to take a quick break, but please stay tuned, everybody watching on the hotspot, because Sam and Sarah and myself are going to talk more island issues and why you should consider them when you go to the polls in just a couple weeks when hotspot returns. We are back on the hotspot. I have Dr. Sam Mabini Young and Sarah Thomas Nedidog. And okay, can we go to camera three, uh, Mr. Director? Okay, Sam was nice enough to point out the fact that I am wearing. I mean, those of you who are into fashion, you might say, okay, the, these two colors do not match. These are Arizona State socks. Yes, I am in the graduate program right there. Sam, too, is a Sun Devil. Well, I supported family members who went to ASU. Okay, and great you, campus. The late Pat Tillman. And yes, a Pat real Tillman, American hero. It was Jake Plummer. <laughs> Jake the Snake Plummer. Yes, there was um, uh, Gray Rugemer, who's now with the Green Bay Packers, yep. and, and a number of them. And they used to come to my house to eat steak and vegetables. Barry Bonds also went to Arizona yes, State. Yes, that's right. And that Sarah was, was just looking at my socks and just saying, hey, they're cool. I like, I like the color. Yeah. <laughs> All right, ni nice color. Okay. <laughs> well, more pressing issues are what our island faces, and mm. certainly that is why Sam and Sarah um, have come here today to share their thoughts with you in the hopes that you um, might give them one of your votes when you go to the polls. And so, uh, Sam, we'll go to you uh, for your question. I want to talk about your work um, as a doctoral candidate, right? You've mm -hmm. done a lot of work earning your PhD in human resources education. So how does that and knowing, you know, the, the impacts on private sector and, you know, how HR... Uh, comes into play as far as like running companies and making sure that they uh, they're strong and they can survive and, and that they do thrive in their economies. How does your background in that, how will you work with like the private sector here? Well, I believe that many children, many families may not necessarily know what kind of work opportunities are out there. And, um, and they may not necessarily even know what kind of training programs are here. So my doctoral program, I really focused in on what the community is doing, what families are doing, what work or businesses are doing to help provide that information as early as like middle school so that students understand what's the reality as far as what jobs are available, what are the potential jobs that, that will be coming down the pipes, especially with the, let's say the military buildup, what are the income uh, keep up, uh, potential mm -hmm. um, and so forth. Uh, but I think, if, if anything, that I, I believe is so important is that career technical ed education is uh, an option, a viable option that will prepare a person to, to, you know, to provide the kind of lifestyle and quality of life that they want. And we, we need to do a better job in helping our students and families understand that and recognize that those jobs are available and those jobs are in high demand. Mm -hmm. I have interviewed probably a dozen times over the last mm -hmm. two years in the pandemic the uh, Society of Human uh, resources management and they even sure. said the role of HR now has has grown in so many different ways mm -hmm. and it's more important than it's ever been yes uh, to yeah. industry to government to federal contractors Absolutely. and yeah so thank you for sharing your thoughts on that all right Sarah you were talking about um, substance abuse and how you have made your life's work to make sure that we as Guamanians are taken care of um, so if elected uh, the drug battles that that our people continue to fight um, are very well established so how will you fight to keep drugs off of our shores, as well as providing, continuing to provide resources for those who are, who are going through their own battles with that? I think that um, in the last couple of years, our Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center has done a tremendous job getting out there and expanding the programs. We now have programs that we didn't have before, so that's a good thing. But I'll tell you, there's more to be done. And as I was saying, you know, getting uh, more people trained and certified as substance abuse counselors, folks to get trained at the, at the village level and the family level to know how to do early identification and prevention, I think those are critical. And so bringing those again to the village level where you have people that have that background in behavioral health, in drug and alcohol treatment, can work with the families on the ground in the village. They don't have to go to an office or, or somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like doing business the old fashioned way. And that is being on the ground with our families in their homes, in the villages. And I think that's really critical. And that's 
kind of like a, a different way in which to do work. And we're doing that in some regard, but I'd like to see that increase. So a greater presence of social workers, human service folks, and people that are trained in behavioral health and drug and alcohol treatment to be really right here, working along with the mayors, working with, uh, with uh, the, the community and different family leaders, traditional leaders as, as we call it, like the heads of families. Absolutely. Working with them, yeah. Well, it, and, it, and in our culture, absolutely, it all starts exactly. with women are revered above everyone in our in our community yeah. in our culture so thank you for sharing your thoughts on that all right uh dr sam mabini young uh legislation I, I have to go back a little bit right but i looked at some of the legislation that you introduced when you were in the 31st legislature um these include things like mandatory skill assessment for gov guam workers mm -hmm. um and required drug testing speaking of what um sarah was just touching mm -hmm. on right um do you see a need to possibly update these concepts that you previously put on or like amend them perhaps and make them or or do they do they stand current right now and as strong as they've ever been? Th thank you for mentioning those uh, particular laws. Uh, the two that I believe I'd love to go back and revisit were two, two which I'm very proud of. Hindsight being 2020, <laughs> of course. Uh. One is the College and Career Readiness Act or mm. the CARE Act, C-C-A-R-E Act. And that uh, is the law that transformed um, a decades old curriculum in the in DOE and transformed it in a way where teachers are now um, responsible in helping the students um, understand the connection between school and their careers or college. And so I'd like to go back and see how perhaps how work-based learning, service learning is one of them, and how we need to maybe revamp that and focus more on other ways uh, where students can get their actual work experience beyond service learning. So internships, externships, job shadowing. Uh, the other law that I had um, passed was the international prison, prison transfer. And that, that allowed uh, the governor of Guam, working with the AG's office, to identify prisoners or um, to maybe repatriate back to their home where they could possibly rehabilitate better. I'd like to go back to that and see how we can really revamp that, um, see which, which members can possibly uh, you know, help uh, go back home and reduce the impact that we have in our mm -hmm. growing population at DOC. I think that would actually be, be interesting as someone who, you know, I mean, the world's a, such a different place than mm -hmm. it was even, you know, as recently as 10 years ago, but mm -hmm. to actually go back and revisit um, policy ideas that you mm -hmm. put forth and everything and say, you know, oh, you know, maybe they are a candidate for revision at this point. So yeah, no, nothing wrong with that. So thank you That's for sharing, right. Sam. Sure. All right. Okay, Sarah, um, if you had your choice of legislative committees, Right. Say like an inauguration day, like, you know, the, the, the majority, the minority, they're all they're all getting together and everything. I'm going to give you two. Right. Which two committees, if you had your choices, uh, one or the other, would you like to sit on as chair? Um, well, the first one is going to definitely be health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I think I'd like to do uh, governmental operations. Uh, I think that would be very interesting as well with my uh, I'm a very astute observer of processes and systems, and I spent a lot of time uh, working with uh, with nonprofits, but with the federal government and local government as well. And so I think that's one another way in which I can contribute is looking at what those systemic issues are and in, gov in the government and how we can you know improve that and bring it to a, a, a higher level so that we can improve our standards of services to our people. So health and governmental operations would be great. So that's your wish list right now. I don't, yeah. know, I don't know if that's part of the Amazon wish list, but certainly that's, <laughs> that's Sarah's wish list. So you basically just, yeah. and Sam, to be fair, may I ask you, if, if you get elected, right, mm -hmm. what two committees would you want to chair? Education, higher education, um, and of, of course, uh, economic development would be another one. Uh, sometimes they combine them, but those are mm -hmm. the areas that I'd really like to focus on. Um, we need to do a better job in uh, having our educational system work together mm -hmm. and, um, and also in how that is connected to the economic uh, development needs of our, of our island. Um, I believe that, and, and you know, going back to what Sarah had shared, um, the government operations is, is part of that, although I mean, and we can belong to various committees, mm -hmm. right. uh, but, those are, but those are critical, those are critical committees. Um, improving our go government operations, of course, is, uh, is always important. But again, education, higher education, and economic development. All right. Well, you have the wish list from both of these prospective yeah. candidates. Uh, well, they are candidates, prospective senators, I should say. So, Dr. Sam Mabini Young, uh, what is your uh, number on the ballot once again? I'm number 16 on the Republican side of the ballot. Number 16 on the GOP side. And Sarah, your number, if you Number please. 21 on the Democratic side. Number 21. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. So, 
Hopefully, they have uh, given you something to think about, given you something to consider when you go to the ballot. Again, as I said, both of these lovely Chamarita island princesses, to be sure. <laughs> um, very, very well accomplished. Very, very humble, too, and a very, very honest public servant. So thank you for sharing some of your time thank with you. us. Um, and thank good you, luck Jason. on the campaign trail. Thank you. Thank Jesus you. Martin. All right. Thank you very much. Well Viva done. Guam. <laughs> thank you, KUAM. Uh, thank you very much. The honor was truly all ours. All right. And stay tuned, everybody, because we got a couple more stories coming up. The hotspot continues right after this.